Yeah, I use uh, Logic Pro for like audio and um, Premiere Pro for video. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I used Audacity when I did it. You ever heard of Audacity? I have. I have. It was all right. We used that for audio. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I didn't do any video. Okay. You know, you I learned one and just stuck with it. You know, there was probably better stuff out there, but yeah, I want to say Audacity. That's that's free, right? Yeah, it was free. Yeah, and that was probably that's the, that's the draw in for a lot of people. That was the draw in. But yeah. I've heard I've heard of people actually making um like music like good, people that make good music like that make it on Audacity. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, yeah. it has you know it has all the features and it was free, so. What was your what was your podcast? Maybe we can start there. Like, how was your podcast? How was doing it for you? What was the idea for you doing a pod? Like, yes, thanks. So I started a, a podcast in 2015. Okay. Um, so my name is Andrew Paul Cronin. So the name of the show was the Q and A, the question and answer with APC. Um, I was a teacher at the at the time when I was doing the podcast. What were you What were you teaching? I taught eighth grade English, Virginia okay. Beach. Yeah, public school eighth grade English teacher. It was, it was we can get into that if you want. Yeah. So, um, but when you're a teacher, you can't, it's, it's hard to, you know, rightly so you got to, you, you can't, you're like a public person or, you know, so you can't, you, you can't go crazy on, mm, on like the radio, on the internet right? And shit, on like, the internet. Yeah. Um, but I was really, I, I, like, I wanted to talk to people. Like, there was long-form interview shows were always something that I enjoyed, like, growing up uh, listening to Howard Stern and, like, watching, like, 60 Minutes on CBS. And um, I, I just love talking to people. Um, and there, was, there wasn't really a show in town in Hampton Roads in 757 that was doing long-form interview shows with... Um, with with people like musicians, artists, uh, business owners, um, so I was like, oh, I guess I'll I guess I'll do it, and um, I did it. Yeah, so I did forty three episodes. Um, but it was uh, the APC part. I didn't want to use my real name because I I was nervous you didn't want about your students like, to find you? students, uh. to f and not that there was anything like grimy on the, uh, but it was it was. He just on there getting drunk as hell, fucking. Smoke yeah. Halloween. <laughs> I hope my t hope my students don't see this. But I, <laughs> but it was it was tough because I I felt like I I was like half in and half out. Like I really wanted to mm. push it, but I could only push it so far because I had this. What are some things you feel like you couldn't do or didn't do because of <sighs> you know? You yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, language or expressing my my personal viewpoints. So, like mm. as a teacher you you don't like you don't talk about like who you vote for or mm. um you know politics or religion or that you know. used to be that used to be everybody just people not just teachers like you know like um uh, maybe you can speak to this here i think you're a little older than me so it's like people didn't even used to tell each other who they voted for sure like not just a teacher just anybody in regular life mm -hmm. it was just a like we have this we have a level of respect for each other so where it doesn't really matter who we voted for that's like a private thing yeah right? that drove me crazy growing uh, up yeah what the part the reason that people did that or uh no that people wouldn't tell you because i mm. like i i always ask like i would ask like my mom um i would ask her like who she you know when i got older like a teenager right um and i would ask her like you know who you know who'd you vote for well it's private mm. you know and you didn't like that no because it well, first of all, like she's my mom. Like she's not just some like random stranger. Yeah. So like we should be able to. I get. I'll figure she was just like teaching you like that. Yeah, that like way. the like the old like the yeah. way. Um, that could be. You that might be true. Um. Yeah. So stuff like that. I just you know you can't. You are. Uh, you know, you're a teacher. So you, you have to have you, a yeah. You a certain image. You have to. Uphold. Yeah. Yeah, and as you should. Um, but that made being Andrew interview person a little tricky. Were you at the Hermitage Museum at this point in 2015? No, that was before. Yeah, I, yeah. I taught before I was there. Um, so I taught for 12 years, um, two different schools. I loved I loved teaching. It was great. It was that's kind of like my my third career um, and Hermitage would be like the fourth, I guess. Um, but yeah, I love teaching. I loved those, like working. Eighth grade is a great age. Um, be, f I liked a lot of people when I was like, I was a middle school teacher. They're like, man, that's like. But when you're in eighth grade, you, you are, you're still a kid. So like you can sort of present things and get people to sort of start thinking about whatever. Like you can present a thing and they could say, oh, 
but they're also like old enough where we could talk about like what's happening outside. We could talk about like real world stuff. And like as an English teacher, we would read books and we would like write and we would do poetry and like a lot of that stuff comes out in the English classroom, like how you're feeling or what's going on in, at home or, you know, what you see walking to school today or so as an eighth grader, like they were kids, um, but they were old enough where we could have like real conversations and we did. And that was great. Like, and you know, um, every day, every day driving home, I felt like, man, that was like an intense, important, great experience. What was, what would you, what do you think is, um, one of the greatest books that are for eighth graders that maybe people learn a lot from? And also, do you have kids that like still tap in with you to this day? Were you like, were you like anybody's favorite teacher that like they fucking um, hit you up to this day? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe in the comment section below, people might. Everybody's like, yeah, I hated him. He would always give me a damn. Um, Took my phone. Yeah. So the, so the two questions there. Um, the Outsiders was a book that I read when I was that age. It's a lot of the same books. I'm 45. So, um, and by the way, a lot of my colleagues were like, I bet you're the oldest person like on that, on this show. So on this show, it, do you think I've got a few 45? years over Asa. Asa? Are you older than Asa? Um, I, I don't think he's who's the oldest person. Well, maybe, maybe 45, maybe. Um, yeah. So there are a lot of the same books. So Outsiders um, was one. Do you know that one? I've heard of it. OK. What, what's the quick summary? I think uh, I, feel like I read summary, it. When I, I think I read it in school. Um, a bunch of um, brothers. They don't have parents. They all sort of work. They're like greasers, so that they're sort of like white t-shirt, leather jacket, hair slicked back. Um, there's like two rival gangs. Um, there's like knife fights. Mm. That's kind of that's kind maybe, of it. maybe was, I, maybe I read it in school. I feel like I used to love uh, Goosebumps books when I was a mm. kid a lot. Yeah, Goosebumps are great. That was before my time, but I know about them. And my wife um, read those. Um, Outsiders that, is one. Yeah. Um, Man, I'm kind of blanking on some. There was there was a more like a called Freak the Mighty, which was a book that came out probably in like the mid mid '90s or so. That was in the curriculum that a lot of people liked. Um, two kids, completely different, um, total opposites, but like got together as like friends and like went on journeys and learned about each other and themselves and their parents and. Um, yeah, so there was, you know, we read books. I mean, I never really liked to read. I never really liked to be in school. Mm, how did um, you become a teacher? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, also, before, so yeah. I guess just so we don't skip it, did, are you, were you kids' favorite teacher? Do people like hit you up? Oh, right, there was, that was uh, the second part. Um, I mean, I can't, I, I don't know really how to answer that. I, I, the students and I always did really well together. I think if anything, and it's probably true at the Hermitage too, like my strength wasn't really like teaching, like how to like write sentences and do commas and things like that. I did that um, well, but my strength was was like creating an environment where people like felt comfortable and like respected. And mm. like I I I like worked really hard to like earn their trust and earn their respect. Like by no means that I was I a teacher that was like, you know, you've got to respect me because like I'm older than you. And like, you know, I've got the keys to the class. Like I, it was all about like trust and respect. And, um, so, so yeah, I, I know my students and I did well and, um, we got along and I did seem to do well with students that had issues like behavior issues in other classrooms, didn't have behavior issues in my classroom. Um, and I see them, I taught in Virginia Beach. I live in Norfolk, but I taught in Virginia Beach. They gave me a job first. I would have taught anywhere. But um, I see them around sometimes, like Water Country. Mm -hmm. you, uh, um, um, I got banned now, from uh, Bush and Water Country when I was a not kid. Not Water Country. What's the Virginia Beach one? Um, uh, Ocean, Ocean Breeze. Breeze. Thanks, Kay. Um, <laughs> we, he said thanks, Kay. <laughs> yeah, Ocean Breeze. I came down the slide with my youngest son yeah. and um there's like the person who like takes the inner tube like once yeah, you get yeah. off you know and he was like mr cronin and i was like hey he's like you know so so yeah i there's they're out there and they're doing well i saw one uh, works at um top golf mm. even just on curating that safe space like you're talking about mm -hmm. what are some um yeah what are some things you did to do that and uh, did you like do you apply any of those things now like at the museum I, and that's almost like yeah. you're like what you're teaching them is like 
between it's like not really even what's in the curriculum it's like it's mm -hmm. like a basic human right basic human traits yeah, you know what i mean it's like uh also even we can that's all another thing too just like um yeah like teaching stuff that's like not necessarily in the curriculum like or the evolution of the curriculum because i feel like i don't know on my whole school like when we were in school like i feel like it didn't change much like the world is like a whole new world but it's like the same curriculum yeah so i don't know how that really if that mixes well yeah um what did i do i i um i planned and i i'm always like really prepared so um you know, like I, I probably live, I've learned kind of in the last like 10 years, like I, I probably have like some like anxiety, like disorder kind of thing. Um, like I don't, I exercise and, you know, try to go to bed early and do push ups and stuff, but, um, to try to deal with it. To deal with the anxiety? Yeah. yeah. But that's been a journey. Um, but so I, I try to be really prepared. I try to think about every possible outcome, which is impossible. Um, I try to show up early and like work really hard. Um, and I'm like really, um, it all means a lot to me. So like it was, I knew teaching was like really important every day. I tried like my best to like have those connections and to be patient. And, um, but it's hard being like on, I felt like I was on stage 183 days a year, like with three shows a day. Mm. Like I, I felt it, there was some performance to really? me for teaching there was some like perform not like i wasn't like a real person but like you're literally up there and to make it interesting um you can do whatever you want however to to teach you how to write a good paragraph you can do that however you want you can close the door and you can do whatever you want to teach that skill which is great um so yeah, trying to be prepared and and um, being like empathetic, thinking like how how would I want to be talked to and treated. So when you talked about like what was in the curriculum, um, you know, I don't want to get. I mean, I can, but uh, you know, the public school right now um, is just kind of it's a mess. Um, like since COVID has gotten like way worse. Um, e e well, what just sort of how they're treating the kids and what they're teaching them. Like they're not, yeah. Like the kids know, the kids know like what's, when you get to high school, you know, you're not really keep being taught a lot of things like that are like real, like how to like, like spend money or like how to buy stocks or like how to change a tire or um, how to go like for an interview for a job or like how to, you Nothing know. Nothing that you actually use in fucking life pretty much. Exactly. Um, and we know all these things. Like, we know what are things that we could teach. And the young people will tell you, I want to know how to do this, this, and this. Those things aren't necessary in the curriculum. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. So you said that was, like, your third kind of gig, mm -hmm. the teaching. Maybe You're we can right. back up a little bit. Sure. You want to just talk about just kind of just coming up a little bit? You yeah. Know, so, childhood life. And um, mm -hmm. I guess what was your, your first gig? Yeah, I grew up in um, Northern Virginia, Fairfax County, Annandale High School. Um, I came down here in 1996 to go to Old Dominion University. I wanted to be a marine biologist because mm. um, I liked whales. Um, and, that and I wanted to learn how to surf. Like, that was literally my thought process of, like, where do you want to go to college? Like, the expectation for me growing up was, like, you're going to go to college or whatever. Um, and I wanted to learn how to surf. I knew I liked whales. Um <clears throat> And you were going to surf in Virginia Beach? I, I applied to f a school in Florida, a school in North Carolina, mm. and Old Dominion. And um, I missed the deadline. I was, a, as I kind of said, like I never really liked school. I was, an, I was like a C-plus student. Like did well in PE, did well in English, um, was okay at art, math, awful. Um, yeah, so I, 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 the only school I got into was Old Dominion. Uh, so I went there, and uh, my SAT scores were not great. It was very high in reading, but really low in, in math. And um, yeah, and then and I I failed out my first year at Old Dominion for for academics. Like I barely went to class. Damn, so you dropped out, or you failed? I got kicked out because mm. like I had a point eight GPA, like but not even a one, because um, I just. You know, I was just living it up. And Partying and shit? Yeah. 
and and surfing and like <laughs> yeah. you know it was it was because it, it was it was hard for me i mean i was i was not looking back on it like i was not mature enough or ready enough like to be on my own like to like to do that because you can go to cl- like there's there's always someone coming around like hey like you want to like you want to want to go to the beach or like you want to go for a ride or you want to go for a drive or you want to go to so-and-so's house and every i was like yeah 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 and but you have to be dis- it was hard for me to be disciplined it took a, it took me a couple years so fast forward um a couple years went to tcc um had a part-time job at starbucks um got back into old dominion and um I had an advisor, which is like a guidance counselor, who uh, was like, you know, so what's what's the plan, Andrew? And um, I said, you know, I don't I don't really know. And he said, what do you want to major in? And I said, well, I think marine biology. And he said, I'm going to be honest with you, like your math, sc- you can do that, but it's going to be hard for you because like your math scores are so low, like elementary school, junior high, high school, and like beginning of college, like it's going to be really hard for you. But like your this communications or talking to people or English, those things, like they seem to, your scores are higher and like you seem just like talking to you, like that's something that you could do. So like think about communications, which is like, you know, media, broadcast, newspapers, I guess at the time. Um, so like so i sw- he he was like the first person that told me like what your strengths were yeah. yeah and i don't know why my parents didn't um i mean did they really know like what your I don't math think, scores were and you know what i mean i mean they checked they got like my report card or whatever but they didn't i don't know if they had like an awareness in the house as like andrew seems like this and his sister is like see like strengths you know and i mean they knew us and loved us and they were great parents but i don't think they really thought like what is andrew what are some strengths that he has like as a person that are going to move on as he moves on like well now you even say that i don't know if i've ever heard that in school or really from any like teacher they it's always like do whatever you want to do like you could do anything but I don't know if anybody ever broke it down to us to where, like, what are your strengths? Like, this is much, what you might be better at or might come easier to you or what you might enjoy yeah. doing more. I don't know. And I took that advice that my advisor gave me, and I used that um, carefully, but honestly, as honestly as I could, like, when I was a teacher. Because after, you know, after spending every day for... Once you're at, like, day 100 of, like, 183 school days, like, you know, I, I knew, you know, I could tell you everything oh, um, like about your strengths kids. and weaknesses yeah, yeah. about the kids um academic behavioral whatever um and i did if there was an opportunity like for their parents you know i yeah. love the parent teacher conferences that was like one of my favorite things so yeah so um to answer your question i became um i got into radio i got an internship at um FM 99, WNOR, it's a rock station here, okay. and 106.9 The Fox. I did, like, promotions, so that'd be like, we're going to be out of Jiffy Lube today, we're going to be handing out T-shirts, like I was the person behind the table, yeah. like, handing out keychains. And then I um, was able to get, I did weekend overnights on the radio, so that's, like, on the radio from Friday and Saturday nights from midnight to 6 a.m. on on the rock station, 98.7, um, it was broadcast from like Richmond to the Outer Banks, North Carolina. What are you talking about up there? Are you like introducing songs? Like yeah, you're yeah. So radio was a was a fantastic creative job, probably in the fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties. And then when I got to it in the late nineties, it was became less of like a creative thing because my whole shift, that whole six hour shift or however long it was, was was literally like spit out of a computer like three days before that. Mm, so so script day was really no. Yeah, like creative the songs yeah. were all in order based on like market research, which is like they bring 45 people together like at the Holiday Inn and give them like Jimmy John's and they say they play like songs and they're like, <laughs> Yo, do you like this song? And they're like, yeah. And then they decide where that like, goes. Like, fucking let us, but y'all got some more pizza? Right. Um, That's funny as shit. That's mm-hmm. how radio, what were you getting paid for? Or how much were you getting paid at this time when you were on the radio? Uh, I don't remember, but it was late '90s, so probably like six fifty or seven dollars an hour. I mean, like minimum mm. wage. 
So it was like a minimum wage. Oh, yeah. It was like yeah. totally hourly and like no benefits or whatever. But it was a great experience. And I was at the time like, and a lot of my fr- like I was still in college. So I was grinding away during the week going to class. And by this time, like I had matured more. Um, and I would, I would drive home. The radio station was in Chesapeake. It still is in Greenbrier in Chesapeake. And I would drive home at like 6.30 a.m., like really jacked because it's like it's exciting to be on the radio. Did it feel like the, that performance aspect, like when you were teaching, like being on the radio? Uh, no, it felt horrifying and scary. Mm. Um, Scarier than te- teaching in front of the kids? Um, yeah, I never really felt comfortable like pressing the microphone. It was hard. For, I could never really get out of my head that there was people like half a you know like half the state and some of north carolina could mm-hmm. be listening it's also another thing to that too is like it's because you're just talking to yourself kind of mm-hmm. like even for me like it's like like this has kind of become easy to me because i feel like we're kind of we can bounce off each other's energy and we kind of just focus on each other right but when you're just talking to a camera or just like in the fucking radio with nobody else on the other side i'm sure it's a, it's a learned skill you know you can, you can learn it and become good like great at it but that's super awkward to me yeah, you're right, Samir. You know, they tell you what, <laughs> yeah, what's, what's funny about that. Yeah, no, it's just funny. When you say our names, it's just funny. You're like, thank you, Kay. You're like, uh, that's right, Samir. Like, my bad. All right, my bad. Um, I love it. But that's what they say. <laughs> they say you should t- pretend like you're talking to one person. Mm. So, like, one thing they tell you, if they tell you, is... Um, Nobody told me. Well, you don't want to say... Um, How's everybody doing tonight? Mm, I'll say, how are you doing tonight? How are you? Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. You personalize it. Mm. What are some other tips? Broadcasting tips you, you remember? Um, what are some tips? Um, I don't know. Stick to the script, Andrew. They like, well, you rewrote this show on the teleprompter. Well, this is the thing. So there wasn't really... The script was only the songs, and mm. you, could, you had liners. So um, there was breaks at... 20 after the hour, 35 after the hour, and 50 after the hour, like commercial breaks. And going into a commercial break, they would have a liner, and it would have um, not word by word, but it would say Saturday, May 25th, 1 to 2 um, at, at Priority Auto. Mm. Um, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so are going to be out there with Chanel's Pizza. Um, I would write my whole shift out word for word, every song, every, every artist where, and I would, I would read, like I would read it, which is not what you're supposed to, you're supposed like to be loose. Like, you're, like you're reading. Yeah. I don't know if I, I still have some cassette tapes of it. Um, but yeah, so, cause I was so nervous to screw up. So I re- would read it. Yeah, so you flunk out of. ODU, you end up going back. Well, that's a little, yeah, yes, you that's technically this, true. Yes, uh, you mm-hmm. get this radio gig. Um, right. I guess yeah. Like how how long were you doing that? And then like what was it? Yeah, what was it from there? Yeah, I did. I did two years, about two years total at the radio station, and um, I mean, I liked it, but it was not. Um, it never felt comfortable. And then. Um, I moved back home to Northern Virginia um, because I was looking for like a job, not necessarily in radio, but looking like for the next thing. And then um, this was 2003 and um, George W. Bush was president and he got in that war with Iraq. Mm, Wait, wait, so my bad to cut you off. So were you you broadcasting... After 9-11, like on no, 9-11? No, uh, yeah, I was not on the radio like during on that day of 9-11, but I was working at the radio station in between 2001 and 2003. Mm. And so, and it was, a, it was, um, you know, Hampton Roads is a, is a military town and um, a lot of people, um, you know, are, are working really hard and are in the military and, um, you know, there's, it's, it was, it was tough because I had concerns and questions about whether or not, um, this war was, was a, was a just war. I didn't feel like it was. And, um, isn't, isn't the kind of the national consensus right now after so much time has passed that it wasn't really a just, just war? Like we shouldn't have went there? Isn't that kind of the... I would say that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But at the time, 
living here um, and in anywhere, that was not that was not the way it was. And not only was it not that way, anyone that had an opinion that was like, you know, you were against the troops, but you know, all the all all of that stuff that it was is, like it's always said. like how woke culture was, like is now kind of like um, what I, was woke I, culture like in those days, like in nine eleven in two thousand one before really social media, uh-huh. like what was like, I guess it was just like outside with people like you didn't really talk about shit or like what how what was the version of canceling in the in those early days if, um, if there was one. Yeah, I mean that's it's it's you know I mean it's it's different it's they're they're different they're different things like what was the canceling then about? Yeah, I guess like if you're against the troops or something like mm-hmm. what was like now how you know how people cancel you now like they'll get you fired they'll blast you on social media this that mm-hmm. was there a version of canceling like pre internet kind of like that? I think I, I don't really know I the the thought that is in my head about that is you people had to really screw up in a really public way to get canceled. But there, it was, it was different because like the methods that people would be aware of a thing, like not everyone could chime in, right? You would read about in the newspaper or you would see like Tom Brokaw on the nightly news, like talk about some scandal, but you had to, I mean, people had to really, you kind of really had to do something. You had to be really famous and do something probably really bad and have your face literally like on the news mugshot to get to get canceled I, I i guess i don't know i wasn't really that wasn't really a thing that i was tracking yeah so you're doing okay so you're doing a radio right. gig for two years mm-hmm. right so moved home was thinking about what my next job was going to be and then um the iraq war was going on i f- i was um angry about that um and it was right in 2004, there was going to be a presidential election. Um, I was, did not like George W. Bush and, um, he was going to be running again and I wanted to be involved in trying to stop that from happening. So there was some, um, candidates that were going to be running against him, some democratic candidates. I wouldn't necessarily claim that I'm a Democrat, although I usually vote that way. Um, but yeah, so I worked for Howard Dean, um, who was a presidential, a Democratic presidential candidate at the time. He was the governor of Vermont, mm. and um, he was a doctor and was, like, very progressive and not, like, a hippie, but, like, was, like, they had, like, universal health care and, like, okay. you know, like, take care of people. And he's on his Bernie vibes. Early. Yeah, he was, yeah. like, pre-Bernie. But you're right. That's a good reference. Um, similar. And so I, I worked in the press department for Howard Dean's campaign in New Hampshire um, because there's like the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary. And then if whoever wins those becomes like the front runner for the Democrats or Republicans or. And uh, yeah, so I worked in the press department for Howard Dean. Did he, did he win that? No, he lost. Okay. So we all got fired. And then I'm yeah. And then I moved back here. What and, was some of your your duties doing that? It was some, yeah, some stuff you learned from that. Yeah, that was a really fun experience. Um, you said press secretary? I, press, I worked in the press. I was a press intern was my oh, title. Yeah. Um, so my job would be to go out to where he would speak. Um, he would speak to people in the state, and I would record it. I would interview people that were there. What do you like about Howard Dean? I would transcribe it. We would put it on um, the website. This was like pre-social media. It was audio recording that you were doing? Uh I know it was, it was like pen and paper. Oh, like I would write his yeah. speech while he's talking. No, like I would, uh, yes, sorry. I would audio record that. We would record that. And then I would interview people and like, tell me your name. Uh, um, and I would write it down and then we would get a quote and put it up uh, and you know, um, yeah. So I did that and, uh, you, you could look it up. He had a, a, a rally like a, like a, like a campaign rally. And he was, it's called like the, the Howard Dean scream. You could look it up. Um, and he was like, we're going to go to New Hampshire and we're going to go to Iowa and we're going to go to California. And he was like hyped. It was like a big, like, like arena with like thousands of people. And he was on stage and he was like really hyped up and the media, um, took it and said like, 
oh man, like he's like crazy and he's like, listen to him. Like he's wild. He's screaming, he's yelling. Like, look at him. He's crazy. Mm, they made him sound like belligerent. Yeah. And he wasn't though. Or what was your No, he, w- he was. In your experience, he was just. Totally mellow, like literally a doctor, like mm. like like a primary care physician doctor, not like just, a surgeon. He was just getting the people hype, like he, yeah. And they uh, use like the mic line, so there's like the whole. This is really getting into the weeds with it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> there, my bad. What's his name again? Freaky Howard Gordon? Dean. Howard Dean. Okay. Yeah. Um, they used the mic line. The mic line. So it was direct mic, and so it was like really like he was like hyping up on the mic. But there's another clip of like if you were in the arena and you hear like the because the crowd's going nuts. And so they used um they used like what made it better. If they, they didn't ever play like the arena capture of it because it would just sound like, you know, like a hype arena. They just used that and like they made the crowd sing, sound silent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they made it sound like nobody was into it. They just made it sound. They didn't make they they didn't manipulate it. Uh, just to be honest, but they chose which audio feed to use, and they mm-hmm. chose the one that didn't have the crowd background in it. Um, and that that one that they used just made him sound. Mm. That's know. that's funny. So that's what that ended up kind of killing his whole campaign. Absolutely. That's that's fucked up actually. But mm-hmm. I mean, you're on a fucking stage talking to thousands of people. You're gonna. That gives you energy. So, yeah, you're going to be hype. Like, and yeah, that's exactly you're, you're right. You're at a rally. You're trying to hype up the people. So it's like, oh. yeah, that's, what, that's how we felt. So and, you get fired after that. Your job is over. Yeah. And then I moved back here to. Um, oh, so this was in, in this Northern was in, Virginia? Uh, it was in, actually in New Hampshire. Okay. So I lived in, in um, Northern Virginia, was angry at George W. Bush, got the job in New Hampshire because there was um, like voting going on in New Hampshire. Also, before I move on, I guess who was the runner-up, like versus George Bush? So we lost to John Kerry, um, who. So that ended up he ended up being like versus like the main one versus George Bush. Yeah, and he lost. Like I knew he would because he's super boring, and um, yeah, yeah, he lost, and we got George Bush again. Okay. Yeah. So you finished the campaign. Oh, right. Yeah, so we finished the campaign. <laughs> I moved back down here and um I didn't know what to do. I didn't know I didn't know what to do. I knew it wasn't going to be radio. Um and then I a lot of people were telling me uh, you should be a teacher. Um and I and and a, like friends, family, people I trusted were like you should be a teacher. And I was like I don't like I couldn't stand I couldn't wait to get out of school. But a lot of like people I really trusted we kept saying it. So I was like, "All right, well, let me let me how do how do you do that?" So you you can do that by a couple ways. You can go to graduate school, you can go to something called the career switcher program, which is like a super fast track like Norfolk State, TCC, Old Dominion, every college has this like you have to have a college degree and like 5 years of work experience which you can sort of piece together however you want and you can become a teacher in like three months like going back to this really short five years experience of what of of any kind of work experience not even to do with teaching not even to do with teaching yeah anything and um so you can become a teacher in three months uh yes which is scary to think about but yeah but that's what i did and i was a substitute teacher so i became a substitute teacher and um and i remember my first my first day as a substitute teacher um, was at Bayside Middle School, and I was a reading specialist. I remember driving there because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, driving there to the middle school, and you get like these lesson plans, which is like what to do. And it was basically like reading to kids, like um, reading to kids, and um, and I I did that, and I felt like I got something out of it, and I felt like the kids the kids seemed to get something out of it. Um, and I remember driving home and feeling like, I think this, I think I can, it felt right. Mm. And that was one of the first times, if not like the first time in my life, like a job felt right. And, um, that was really exciting and felt really good. Mm. Um, and it was important. Like I wanted to do something that I felt like was like meaningful and like contributing or whatever, you know? So you were a sub first. So I was a sub for many years and that, mm. that oh, was the, years. Or you, so you weren't the type of sub that just plays a movie? You know when a cell comes in. If that in. was the learning plan or the lesson plan, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
but that's hard. Movie is actually the hardest because one of the hardest because people don't, if it's not a good movie, which they're generally not in school, people aren't going to pay attention. And then you're having to like put mm. out all these fires. Yeah. Cause like it, I would rather create a thing that I know is going to play well and work and like, and do that. Um, yeah, so I was a sub for substitute teacher for several years and then went to this career switcher pro program at Old Dominion and um and then and then got a job teaching. And as a sub, was it like steady work? Was it like every day somebody needs a sub? Yeah, it's, yes. You can as and are a, you and are you being a sub for different subjects? Like mm -hmm. okay. you can choose what grade level you want. Um I did high school and middle school. I did like three days of high school and knew pretty quickly that high school wasn't for me. Um, maybe it was just, I, I felt like my experience in the high school as a teacher was like the damage was kind of done. Like the kids were just like, you know, they're, they're mm. just done with school. They've been yeah. through it all, you know, um, it's but not like much you could do to affect change, I guess. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. how I felt. I mean, you could, you, and, and they, and people do for sure. I, I mean, I know speaking from just personal experience when, bro, when we got to high school, we just kind of stopped caring. Right. We're skipping, we're doing whatever, like, I don't know. But for me, I always do, for me, like, schooling and all that, like, the main thing I really got out of it is just interacting with people. Mm -hmm. Meeting all different types of people from different backgrounds with different mindsets and just how to how to move around people. And, you, and it's like, you kind of you kind of take that for granted because I remember, like, I was always just kind of, I was always comfortable talking to people, like, I, I knew, like, a lot of people and shit. And then, but I got out of high school and I didn't go to college right away. Well, I didn't go to college. I went to like college for like three weeks. I got my real estate license, but I just I started doing electrical work, and so I stopped really hanging out with a lot of people like that. And I'm just usually at work with like one or two people or something. And then a few years of that, and I realized like I almost like became awkward around people a little bit. It's like a that's a skill you have to continue to practice. I think mm -hmm. like being around people and, and shit like that. And you learned all the stuff that you talked about learning in high school. You learned all that in between the cracks of the oh yeah of the, like that was not. That wasn't the subject, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think about a lot because um, I have a 17-year-old son and an 8-year-old son. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I wonder how well kids are these days at, at like, talking face-to-face -face in a group setting or one-on-one -on -one or... Um, I, I mean, you know, like, like no one, I don't know if people call any, each other anymore. Do people call each other? Do you call people? I talk to people on the phone, but I do remember, you know, and when we were coming out of middle school and shit, we were like, it was like Uvu. You remember Uvu? No. It was like a video chat platform, like some Skype type thing. All right. But we were talking on the phone, like we were talking to girls on the phone all night. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I would say, I would say um, people still do that. Like my little brother, I have an 18 year old brother now. He's, right. he's about to graduate. He's talking to his friends. He's on, you know, it's on different mediums now. They might be on a game. They might be on a... Right, with a You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. they're they talking shit, they, you know. Okay. But not traditionally like with the phone. Yeah, yeah they're probably texting more than talking yeah. on the phone. Um, So, yeah, I was a teacher and and then... um, Right, so I was a teacher and then... Do you want to keep talking about it? Yeah, we can talk about whatever, whatever. How long were you a teacher? Uh, I was a teacher... You said, oh, you said 12 years, 12 right? 12 years, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I got to a point where did you was there any, was there ever a fight in your class? In those um, years? yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> He's like, you gotta jump in. Was there a fight in class? Also, now you see a lot of these. I just I've been seeing a lot of videos of kids beating their teachers up recently, specifically for taking their phone, which is crazy because that's what I got. Like when I was in high school, I literally got suspended. Like in, in like my, in my high school career, like not even exaggerating, I literally got expelled. I, I got suspended like fifty times. I got expelled in senior year or two, but like a majority of my suspensions were, was for my phone. Cause it was like, if you get caught with your phone, they either take it for like three days or mm -hmm. you get suspended or some shit. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to give it up. But now you see teachers like- What was the other stuff for? Like getting expelled and shit? Yeah. Uh, well, I got expelled cause it, uh, I got expelled really cause it was just all my shit just kept adding up. They were just sick of me, but I got expelled from, um, I had just, it was actually, I got my, I got my, I got a car when I got my license on the first day I ever drove my, my um car to to school like he weren't I was like in eleventh grade and I think as a 
in eleventh grade, you weren't allowed to leave for lunch with your car. Only like seniors could. Right. And I left, and they like they were just tired of me. Like they just expelled me for that. Can I? What kind of car? I, I like cars. Can I? I had a. My parents actually bought me that at the time. I actually ended up totaling it, which it worked out. My parents actually ended up making money off it on it. But um, I had a two thousand six. I want to say Infinity G thirty five. Nice. Yeah, it was a nice car. Starting off nice. Hell yeah. Good for you. That was all my parents. Shout out to my parents. Like I said, I totaled it. Um, they ended up getting like all the money back from the insurance and then like keeping the car and then selling like the totaled car. And then I think they made like five grand on it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. But that was cool. I'm, I'm kind of glad that happened. So my parents weren't just in debt for my car because I didn't really sure. fucking even need that. Maybe I didn't even deserve it, honestly. But yeah. Um, so I was, I guess, 41 at the time. I'd been teaching for about 12 years. And um, teaching, I I knew how teaching was going to end. Um, like you get to a point, I was at a point where there's there's like a good retirement package and benefits because it's a like a government job and overall those benefits and like you would say it's good. Don't don't people always talk shit about how teachers really don't get paid much? I mean, yeah, they don't get paid enough. Um, the pay isn't great. It was, you know, it's not great. They, they should get paid more and, you know, because it's a really, really important job, you know, and if we value education and teachers, we should pay them like professional people, which they're not paid that way. Um, the benefits, like the, the health care, the dental, um, the retirement package, all of that is, 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 is good, is, you know, for what it is. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and it's nice to have, like if you're in a job and don't have that, and once you get that, like, it's really important to have those benefits. Um, so I was, I had been in for like 12 years. And then if I was going to stay for another 12 years or whatever, like that was going to like on paper, that was going to be a huge, that was going to be it. Like I would be 50, whatever years old. And, um, at that point, you're just kind of a fool to not keep going because like you earn, like when you retire, like you make more money based on like how many years you've done it and all this stuff. But you have to go to, you got to go to 65. Yeah. Something like that. And, um, and there was other stuff I was interested in and, um, and I, I don't know, like I, I, there was also parts of teaching like the, the, the SOL testing and all the different things that that was hard to be a part of i think testing is important but um they were you know they're really grinding these kids on these tests mm. and um and it was hard to be for me to like be a part of that and perpetuate some of those things um and uh my boy had to beef with the sols yeah bro i, mean, I did too honestly yeah you should um so yeah, so I, I was like, I, I don't know, like I I, I think I'm gonna try something else, yeah. and um, and then th this job at the Hermitage Museum and Gardens in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, came up. Um, I have like a friend of a friend works there, and she there was like a Facebook post. I'm not on Facebook, but um, some of my friends are, and they knew I was kind of thinking about trying something else, and they sent me this Facebook post and. Within an hour of that Facebook post, I was kind of sending messages to people um, and emailing and sort of getting my stuff together and and um, and applied for the job. And um, yeah, that interview, my boss now, Jen Duncan, executive director, who's a great boss, um, she said, there was a big table and everyone who works there, which is not many, there's like only like nine of us, they're all around the table. And she said, well, I don't see how anything on your resume qualifies you to do this job. And like, that was her first question. And I was like, well, I kind of agree with you, but, and I sort of started from there and try to, you know, talk, but the podcast, yeah. when I did not to keep jumping around, but like when I was doing the podcast, I was teaching. Was that, that was that the final stretch of your teaching? Yeah, it was like the last three years. Yeah. Um, I met so many people and um, you could see like Andrew is friends with and has met and worked with and interviewed like all of these people from, from musicians to race car drivers to um, artists. Uh, was it a NASCAR authors. driver? 
No, he never made it all the way to NASCAR. I love NASCAR, by the way. There's a race on right now, but um, I was listening to it on my way up here. You were listening to the race. Man, NASCAR race on the radio is, I know you're laughing, Kay. Um, I hear you. It is unbelievable. Like the way they make, because NASCAR is pretty boring to watch. I still watch some of it. Um, but they make the radio broadcast of a NASCAR race sound like the most exciting thing ever. Mm. There's four people stationed in the four <laughs> corners of the track turns. Um, and they go every time the cars go around the track, they cut to them. And it is so it's wild. You should you should listen to it. One I got I to check that you out. You should. Yeah. So anyway, um, so I got the job at the Hermitage. So I know you're the pro- I want to say I think I wrote it down. So I want, I want to say it correct. You're the project. Um, you're the project programs man- or the public programs manager. Yeah. Was that the job you officially got? Like first job you got there, or did you like work up to that? What was the first job you had there? Um, is that was the job I got? I was hired as public programs coordinator on like a probationary basis, and uh, if I didn't screw up too badly, I would be called public programs manager, mm. and uh, they were going to do like a six month like probation to make sure see how I did. And, um, after a month and a half, like f- I got the manager uh, title. What was your, what were your duties is that? And, um, so I guess talking to all these different artists uh-huh. and stuff that kind of inspired you to want to be more involved with the arts. It helped me get the job for sure at the museum. Oh, that's, that's, that was part of your pitch. Like, yeah, check out my podcast. Like, it was part of my pitch and part of what they did in researching me to know, like this guy was a teacher for the last 12 years and this job is not really teaching um so why would he why would we hire this guy who is not qualified for this job um but a lot of my job is is like hiring and collaborating with musicians and artists and creating events and creating like fun engaging safe spaces for for everybody to come to um so there was parallels in between it um i forgot the question sorry uh well, also, what were your duties, I guess? Is, yeah. What do you do now? What do kind I do? Of, you kind of just answer that, too. But yeah. Like, yeah. But it's also like you took these uh, pieces of these skills that you kind of like use at these other jobs. Like you're talking about creating the safe spaces. Mm-hmm. You were talking about doing that with the kids, too. Like, yeah. Then, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I never thought I would work in a museum. I mean, I grew up going to museums because I grew up 10 minutes away from Washington, D.C. And, you know, there's great museums up there, obviously. And they're all, most of them are free. And um, we would go to like field trips there. So like I grew up going to museums, but never thought museums were going to be a thing that I would work in. Um, so my my job is to create events to support the art exhibitions. So every summer we have a very large, um, often like bizarre um, immersive contemporary modern art installation. There's 12 acres of gardens and grounds at the Hermitage Museum. And so we, we do, we can do like large sculptures with like lights and things like all over the grounds. Um, things like you can walk in, climb on, look at, see your reflect, like reflection in. Um, so we do art exhibitions. So I create events to support those um, exhibitions, whether that's with the artists themselves, um, but also like evening events, free family events. Um, is that what the sunset on the rivers is? So right sunsets on the river is a, is an outdoor concert series that we do every summer. Um, we're on the Lafayette river. So it's like this mansion, um, that was built in the early 1900s, um, and I saw it too. It looks like a, it's like a house, like the museum. It is, is a, like house, a house. Yeah, but yeah. That's cool too. That it's like you guys are really like you're putting out exhibitions and, and pieces in nature. Like mm-hmm. it's like an outdoor museum. I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's really unique. I mean, it is it is an old house. There were there was a family that founded it that lived there, um, and she collected art. Um, we've got five thousand pieces of art spanning five thousand years. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's from it, like what cultures everywhere um what's the cool what's like what's some of your favorites um i mean we have everything from samurai swords to um you know sculptures and paintings Mm. and um the house in in itself is a piece of art there's it started off as a five-bedroom summer cottage back in the early 1900s and where it's a 42 room there's 42 rooms it's all hand carved wood that was done on site by this british guy um, it is 
it is a wild place. And there's forty two rooms. Was it was it like there's no like a significance hotel to it. type thing or is No, they just had tons of money and built and built and built. Um the Florence Sloan was her name. Um her and her husband William started uh the museum in the house. Is that where they came across their wealth by buying and selling art? Uh, what, no, what that's a, that's a good question. Um, he, the dad, the father, her husband, William Sloan uh, was in textiles, so that's like clothing, uniforms. Uh, he was a. They were New York City rich, like Rockefeller rich. Like the two families knew one another. We've got some letters between them, and in our archives. Um, so they were like, like money, money. And um, he made his money in textiles. He got one of a few contracts for World War One soldier uniforms. Holy fuck! So that was like a big, a big cash out. Um, where was that? Where was he? Where was that based out of? Like, where were they making that? That up? I, that was. Um, I don't know where it was manufactured, but I think the deal was done when they were in New York, and then mm. they would travel to Norfolk, which at the time was like nothing, pine trees, like dirt road. Um, like there was nothing. Um, but I think he saw, uh, the water access for, for transportation, the railroads coming along. So, cause he wanted to get his product out, you know? And, um, yeah, so they moved there full time and her passion became the house and collecting art. And she, um, would build and build, not her personally, but she would like oversee, um, the construction of the house. And, um, there's one room, uh, where Sunny Moonshine played not too long ago, um, and Gary, um, they she moved a whole wing of the house that used to be where the river is and moved it to the other side of the property. And back in like this was I don't know like the 1920s or 30s. They didn't have like jacks and shit where you can just fucking. Yeah, it was. I don't know how. I don't know how to how they did it, but they it was. Had, I mean, they probably in those days they probably had to like just tear it down and rebuild it for real. I, don't no, know if I, they mean, I think they lifted it up somehow. Mm. Yeah. Then, yeah, I know that now they have like jacks. Like you can literally jack right. the house up and like move mm -hmm. it. Like. Yeah, strong armed it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we do. Um, we're you know we're kind of known as an institution that um, does like the unexpected and um, takes. We take like big swings with our art and with our programs. Mm -hmm. Like we try. Um, we we do we do really cool wild stuff all the time. Um, also, I'm sorry if I missed it, but is is the Hermitage Museum now being, is it owned now by descendants of those same people? How who owns it now? Like, what was the, yeah, how's the transfer of it? Sure, down, that's yeah. Down um, so they had two sons. Both of them are deceased. Um, they had um, no children, so there's like no the, the the sons had no children, so there is no like family tree. Typically, you're right. Mm. Like that's what would happen. People would take ownership of it. So we're owned, um, we're a nonprofit company. So we have a board of directors who basically are in charge of everything. Um, so like my, my boss, boss, my, my actual boss, my boss is like the board basically, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a nonprofit. So, um, the city doesn't own it. It's like private property. That's like this non nonprofit business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, so you get there, right? Like a month and a half in, mm -hmm. you get the manager roles where they're fucking with you. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. No, well, I say that. I didn't say that. What'd you say? Like you said, like a month. You said you were on like a six month probationary period or something, and then like a yeah. month and a half in, they kind of like. Yeah, they said. Yeah. Yeah, I did really well. So you're throwing these events. Um, sunsets on the river, right? Mm -hmm. So what's been what what is was like those been like? What's the has there been an evolution in them? Like what is kind of like. I, how from the first one to like how it is this year? Yeah, this What's is some our stuff, stuff you're excited to see there this year. Yeah, I know it started already, right? Yeah, we had our first one yeah. last week. Um, yeah, it's the thirteenth year of doing it. It's um, thirteenth year. Damn. Yeah, thirteenth year. So this is my fourth year. I think we had one year off for COVID. Thirteenth um, year. It's really like turned into Norfolk's like official backyard. It is like families, food trucks, beer trucks, dogs, picnic blankets, lawn chairs. Um, and it's, it's like, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a, like a beautiful place and it's a real like magical place to, to be, um, whether it's like with a concert or to see art or like just to be alone because there's like so many, so many places to, to like get inspired by. Um, 
yeah, so we do, you know, there's different bands that I that I um, find and, and book. Um, a lot of the bands are, I kind of do like different genres. So there's like a swing band, like a, like a rock band, funk band, uh, bluegrass. Like I try to do, there's seven concerts, so I try mm. to do kind of like different genres. What about, uh, what about, what about hip hop? Um, we haven't done hip, well, that's not true. We had, um, do you know Concept? It's the Concept. <clears throat> with a K? Um, Is it with a K? Yeah. I want to say I do. Yeah. Um, he's played, uh, they've, um, yeah, Fusion Groove and Concept have played before last year. Um, yeah, I've worked with some hip hop artists. Yeah, we gotta um, get some, yeah, we gotta not get not so much there. for Sunsets on the River, but yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. What are some, um, because we're trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to do something like that out here. Like, yeah. As far as I really see, our scene is really like most alive on that side of the water, like Virginia Beach area, Norfolk, whatever. Yeah, I've heard you so, say that before. Yeah, so out here we're trying to figure out how to um, have some recurring events to start some type of shows, exhibits. Sure. The Contemporary Art Art Network, Arts Network is yeah. doing their thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's um, great, but we need more stuff. So I actually just went to maybe you can you know, maybe give me some pointers, some things I should be thinking about. Um, I went to I actually went and spoke with the. Um, owners of the Tradition Brewing Company, mm -hmm. Tradition Brewery in City yeah. Center. Mm -hmm. It's really nice in there. It's like tall ceilings. It's big. It like, looks nice to have a, like a stage. They have like a big stage. Yeah. Are you, wait, have you been in there? I have not. Okay. Um, so I spoke with them. We're supposed to have another meeting. But um, right now I'm just trying to find a kind of, kind of first. I, my first step has been, I, I feel like this is the right way, but to find the venue first. Mm -hmm. And yeah, would, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then start kind of trying to build a relationship with them. Sure. Figure out different ways we can curate it to have, we want to have diverse crowds come out. We want to have diverse talent, like even like you're saying, like different genres mm -hmm. of stuff. Like yeah. maybe even incorporate some stand up. you know what I'm saying? Like different, different shit. Just um, kind of try to do our part to like bring the arts onto this side and just have like, kind of just like um, in a way, like teach people to like want, even want to experience that. Because yeah. right now, I think we might have spoke on it a little bit when we met that night. Like, yeah. people out here are just really aren't even accustomed to, like, experiencing, like, live entertainment or live art or stuff. Like, so yeah. I've been trying to find out ways to do that. Yeah, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would start, you're right to start with a venue, for sure. Um, and there's probably, for just thinking about it, like, there's probably two two ways you could go. There could be, like, a, like the brewery, like a place that is, like, private privately owned by whoever um or like a club or something like that or there's the other route which i may you know push you towards a little bit which is like the official like city route so through newport news or hampton or or where wherever you want it to be um probably new you're you know, newport, newport news, news right sure. yeah um, we want to put in good news so yeah. i would look and think about where are open spaces like literally open spaces outside outdoor spots outdoor spots city owned that are just sitting there not doing much and <laughs> i would present an opportunity to the city to like engage these spots because we need it and want it and deserve it see i i like the i like the outdoor spots too but i feel like um we're trying to reach, I want to try to reach the everyday person out here, right? Mm -hmm. And everyday people just aren't really hanging out outside like that. So what we, does that mean? Like, I'm talking about, like, just a nine-to-five person, right, that has a job. Yeah. They're not really in the, they're not, they don't really do anything creative. They go to work, whatever. Okay. If, when they go to have a good time, mm -hmm. they're going out to the bar or to the club or to the brewery to grab a drink and a bite to eat. Mm -hmm. They're not going outside. So it's like, that's kind of where they already want to be, I think. Like, I think the demographic that we're trying to reach or trying to, like, connect to connect with they're not they're like it's like maybe that's the thing like we're trying to go to, to where they're at sure i to can where see they're that. already comfortable at what did you think you about the I mean? zoo Which in zoo? virginia beach like uh, that art show that we met oh at. that was fire like yeah. i love stuff i love stuff like that that's actually funny on that too like you uh i don't know if i told you but you remember like the furniture that was in there like the art piece furniture yeah. i was about to roll up some weed on that shit uh -huh. i walked past and um it was like a table like an all white table and i'm like it's just whatever cool looking table i'm like i'm gonna roll some weed on it and I see everybody's like looking at it like like it's an art piece. They're just like looking at it like from underneath, like taking pictures of it. I'm like, let me not put my stuff on this damn table. So um, did you roll it up on it? Or hell no, hell no, 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 I didn't. I went outside and like sat on the picnic table. But that's Ooh. where we met. It's funny you, you bring up Sunny. Um, mm -hmm. That's where that's where we met. Yeah. yeah. I went. I went. I went. I was there to see her. See but her that light. but that spot I brought it up because like that spot I think uh, I could the be city wrong. owned. Um, 
I think it used to be an old like bait and tackle shop store that is no longer that. So it's like just this brick building. I think it's probably involved with the Neon District, which is sort of like quasi owned. It is kind of owned by the city of Virginia Beach. Um, but they had like that outdoor spot and then they had that, I mean, it's basically a parking lot, right? Like that extended out where like the, the bars were and there was like food happening and people were like, you know, so that wasn't like a bar. That was just sort of like a space that's not being used mm, that you can get like on the exa- cheap. Mm. Um, and that, but I guess there was a building though. So that made a difference. Yeah, was sure. A building. Uh. Newport news has got places for sure, mm. that can be activated. So city owned, want, city, city permitted, maybe even city funded. Ideally, yeah. I mean, it's in there. It's in the city's interest. The, the city, the city should be doing things for their citizens anyway. So if you, if someone like you, who's smart and works r- really hard, um, clearly, um, goes to I them, it. yeah. <laughs> um, goes to them with an idea, they would be, they should listen. I've talked to Asa about this a few times. He's yeah. really he's really the one that even kind of put that in my head originally. Yeah. Like that, how important like art is to a city. Right. And like how that is really like what brings in, like it, that attracts good people. Sure. Like you want to attract good people to your city. Yeah. So I think he's, you know, he, he a lot of stuff he does is like city funded and like, I think he actually yeah. sits on the board of... um. Yeah. Asa is a great person to talk to about that for sure. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ace has you know been at all, sat at all the tables with all the cities and done incredible things and continues to for sure. Um, and it's like, but yeah, you see, the can is really like the only one that's doing stuff like on a consistent basis. And um, I don't know, so but you know, you, I feel like that's how, you put that in my head. Like, I need to go. I'm gonna do some research on some city-owned spots. Maybe there's some city-owned buildings that we can actually like use. Yeah, you should. And, you know, and New- Newport News or whatever city should want to do those things for their citizens, like I said. Um, yeah, you should you should do that. Uh, you know, the only rub on the city part would be, um, uh, you know, the rules or you can't do this or it's got to be over by this or we want this much money for it. And so it might be sort of like, uh, you know, you might want to go through a few smaller you know, like brewery stuff. Not that breweries are small. They're great. You know, they're great. But, um, yeah, I don't know. You should do that. You know who else is... We're going to try to figure something out. Yeah. Yeah. You you know who else is what? Well, you said, um, so Ace is working hard. I was going to say you're also really working hard because you've done like 160 plus episodes of a podcast. This 162. Congratulations. Thank you. You said you said you watched the show. It's it's still kind of amazed me when people say they really like... Because I'd be like, I'd be thinking so people like might catch a clip or two like it's still kind of like, i would be like i'll be feeling like damn do people actually watch like whole episodes and like really follow along with what we're doing what well, do you do you read your analytics i do okay okay sounds fun okay okay checking AGK. the analytics right now um yeah yeah i'm no, so larry's, larry's checking the analytics right now yeah with the the camera um <laughs> i uh yeah, I collaborated with Sonny um, on a on a show, um, a music uh, show at the Hermitage lately, uh, recently, and um, so I was looking. Um, oh, was it like her show? Yeah, her and Gary Dapsam, which is like a side project that she does, um, did a show at the Hermitage um, in this oh, yeah. music room. Um, we had this 1914 custom Steinway and Sons piano, um, like super old, amazing instrument, and um, they played. Um, and she sang and, um, you know, she's so awesome and talented and, um, you know, fascinating. So anyway, I was looking, looking her up on YouTube, like doing research and trying to, you know, hear different performances. And I found your show and, um, I watched that whole episode where she like, you know, did her accent the whole time. Oh, with Raisa and yeah, Bobby. Yeah. And, um, that was a trip. That episode was a trip. Yeah. And was, you know, what's funny about that one, that was random. Like we literally just booked that episode like two days before that. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like because we had a cancellation that week, so like let's just do a Halloween episode, and um, yeah, it was just out the blue. And then I saw that you were on like I don't know what that was like one fifty or something, and and having done my own podcast and knowing like what a grind it is to to put out to be that to do it, and there's you know there's there's people in the seven five seven that have um, started 
a podcast and have not even got to episode 10, right? And so for you, like I immediately took note um, because I know what it takes to do that. And so like I was, so then I just dove in further to your show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's like we really just built a habit now. And it's like, uh, like I, like I kind of tell people like my goals are like, I kind of have goals for like 30 years from now. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I'm not even close to that. So I don't, I, that's kind of how, that's kind of what I used to keep me going. I don't really even think about too much about what I'm doing right now or like what I've done is just like, we still have so much further to go. So yeah. we don't, so the, now I just become a habit. Um, but I think the live shows, like doing the live events is, it may be like our natural, proje- like a natural progression to what we're doing here. Sure. Cause it's here like we, okay, we got to connect with artists. Um, a lot of times we might connect artists with other artists that they didn't know that that might build a new relationship, which might stem to another new relationship or whatever, wherever that goes. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's a natural proje- progression to do that in like real life. Yeah. And start doing these like things where people can come to and experience it. Um, yeah. So, okay. So sunsets on the river. Yeah. That's happening right now. Yeah. Um, when does that end? Like what's. That ends in. And also how can, um, can artists like hit you guys up? Like how can artists be a part of what you guys have going on? Yeah. So I don't. Yes. Uh, so sunsets on the river runs through August. Uh, we've got an amazing summer art exhibition uh, called echoes of the heart by Claudia Bueno, who's a Venezuelan born artist who lives in Arizona. She does incredible, um, art, light, immersive art. Um, And that's being installed right now at the Hermitage. You can see some of it's outside, some of it's inside the museum, um, upstairs galleries, downstairs galleries. So I'm doing programming to support that, um, which we're really excited about. And then then I forgot the other part of your question. Sorry. How can artists be, you know, tap in with you guys? Um, so there, my job is public programs manager, like we talked about. So I, I don't, um, we have curators on staff who are in charge of finding the artists, um, working with artists and, and all of those things. Um, so they can, they can call me direct, um, my name and email and phone numbers on the website, um, the hermitage museum.org oh, yeah. shameless plug. And, um, yeah, and we'll find the. I'll connect you with the right people, and um, yeah, I'm always here to help anybody for anything. Yeah. Maybe we could do some uh, some programming there. Yeah, I would love that. Day. That might be. That yeah, might be some for shit. sure. Yeah. I also want to say, um, it's crazy. I'm a flag when I remember your episode forever, just because of what we were supposed to do it the other day. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Uh, oh yeah, literally. Oh yeah, that, that, I was thinking of that earlier when you were like, you try to um, think of every outcome or whatever i was gonna say like i know you didn't think that was gonna happen when you came to the podcast last time <laughs> yeah what are you gonna talk about it oh um, well yeah literally literally my dog died like as he's pulling up that day so we had to like bury my dog and like so we didn't do the pot but yeah that like so your podcast is gonna be ingrained in my mind forever i'm sorry about your dog yeah i appreciate that yeah that was a uh, that was wild um hell yeah I didn't want to end it on a sad note. Yeah, we uh, we uh, uh. Can I do something? Yeah. All right. So when I did a when I did a show, um, one of the things that I did at the either in the end or like halfway through was like a rapid fire question. Okay. So um, like the setup is I would ask the the guest, um, uh, just like questions or whatever, like the first thing that comes into their head or your head, because we might. Can we do it? Can we do that? Let's do it. All right. And let me grab my. Can I grab my phone? Oh, you have it written down already? It's like in my phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, so you're prepared for this? Yeah, well, I told you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. He said I got it in my phone. All right, let's do it. All right. Let's see. And is your podcast available for people to go still? Like, it's not, it- so, yeah, it was on SoundCloud. That was its original home. And then my brother-in-law convinced me that SoundCloud was going to go out of business, and I had to yank it off there, which never happened. Um, and so I moved it to... They did fall off a little bit, but they're like in the middle, I think, of a rebirth right now. Um, so I moved it to a different hosting platform, and um, for a while it was all, and there was like a website. Um, but then, like, you, had, I had to pay for it all. Like, I had to pay for like keeping it like hosted on yeah. on online, um, and 
so I took it. So I moved it all to YouTube. So yes, the answer to your question, Samir, is yes, the show is available on YouTube. Okay. Um, Do you at, want us to link that in the description? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, okay, for yeah. sure. It's super produced and um, like it's super edited and like super uh, official sounding. Like you're, you're, you just go wherever it goes. And I was. It's more like structured and. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can see you like pre-planning the whole damn episode out like i'm gonna say this and then i'm gonna say this yeah you're you had exactly all your right. questions yeah i had them all <laughs> all right <laughs> let's do it all right here we go you ready let's play rapid fire all right favorite adult beverage like alcoholic beverage i've been on tito's and orange juice lately uh what time do you normally go to bed uh, uh for the past few months probably on average like one one two do you wake up with an alarm no you just like wake up naturally yeah um, what did you have for dinner last night? It's always a hard chicken tenders. Oh wait, no, I had a um. Damn, what did I have last night? I had a damn. I had some. I had some. I went to my cousin's graduation dinner. So I had like a bunch of random food that was there. Congratulations yeah. to your cousin, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the beach of the mountains. Your favorite beach of the mountains. Go to the mountains. Um, describe what's on your perfect pizza. Beef, chicken. And jalapeno. Beef? Like just like ground beef. Okay. Or like the like, you know, like little beef chunks. Yeah. That they put on pizza. Not sausage. Not sausage. I don't need pork. Ground beef. Ground ground beef. Yeah, ground beef. Okay. Um what's a talent that you have that people don't know that you have? I can juggle. Like okay. Three. Okay. I can juggle three. A little bit. Four, like not that much, but I'm solid with three. What's a talent that you don't have but you wish that you had? Mm. That's a good one. Uh, Thanks. Damn. Um I guess I, I wish I could sing, like good. That'd be, that'd be that'd be cool. You rap though. Yeah, it's good. But I feel like when you can sing, it's easier. Like with rapping, you gotta like, like you don't have to put much thought in singing. You can sing any words, and if you're like a fire singer, it'll just be hard. Like, but if you're just rapping, like, ain't really making no sense. You sound like you sound like the dude that's like you know the guy that mocks Eminem. He like doesn't mock him, but he like does the parody Eminem videos, like when he just starts rapping about random shit. Like, uh, it's like, I don't fucking know, but Krispy you just sound like you're just blurting out words. Uh, your favorite, morning, noon, or night? I'm most creative in the morning. Um, how do you feel about the heels of bread? Gross, great, or okay? The, what's the heels? Like the top and bottom part. Oh. Like the outer, yeah. Stay away from it. <laughs> um, Why the fuck do they put that there? Nobody wants it. They know it, bro. I think it, food and shit. I think it makes it look like it's real bread, mm. like you know, you know, I'm like not a, fooling like, anybody, like out of the oven. A lot of sugar in it. Uh, what's your favorite holiday? Mm. Well, for me, I guess it's uh, Bytom. Is that a Bosnian holiday? Yeah. yeah. Um, if we were going to eat after this, where would we go? <laughs> Probably to the cat. <laughs> get some get some chicken sliders. Where's that? What is that? It's a little strip club. Okay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Um, if we were going to eat after this, where would we definitely not go? Anywhere vegan. We're not going. Uh, sports. Boring. Okay. Or great. Sports. Boring. I used to love sports, though. Uh, favorite cereal as a kid? Uh, Cocoa Puffs. Not the, not the thick ones, but like the little pieces one. Was it? Like crispy. Um, I, 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 my parents never bought that for me. We could say we could just for safe measure cocoa puffs. What's your favorite cereal now? I don't really eat cereal no. Okay, who's the last person you hugged? Final question. Probably like one of my family members last night at the dinner. Cool. Thanks for playing rapid fire. That was fun. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Appreciate it. I was funny. I was we get the, the bread question. He said, "He said, good, but just okay." Or what did you say? <laughs> hell yeah, yeah, I love that, bro. Um, hell yeah, maybe that might be a cool spot to leave him on. Um, is there anything else you want to touch on or leave, no, people, just, leave the people with? No, I'm just you know a fan of the show and appreciate the opportunity and you know yeah. got a lot of respect for what you guys are doing. I appreciate that, man. Um, yeah. thank you for coming through again. Drop making the drive twice. Um, hell yeah. All bros links will be in the description. Uh, check out the Hermitage Museum. They have the sunsets on the river as exhibit. Concert, concert series, concert series, and then we got a um, Echoes of the Heart exhibition coming yeah. up. Um, it's free to visit the museum. Um, we're open every day except for Monday. 
um, 10 until 5, it's a great place to come inside or just to go outside and, you know, sit in the gardens. And, um, yeah, come by, please. Oh, yeah. Thank you, bro. Uh, we appreciate you guys for tuning in. And, um, yeah, see you all soon. Peace.